he will attend the BOCC meeting. This was a great win, yes, Glenn. This is a great win for these residents of that area because they got educated, involved, and informed. But your county government is not trying to give you that information and educate you. And until you are on the front lines and the cow pasture next year is becoming a condominium and you're thrown into that quasi judicial process, you don't know how things work. So, as you view your candidates for county commission, understand what their jobs are, understand what their roles are, and start asking the questions. How are you going to get it done? Because one person on that board is not going to make a difference. You need a majority vote. How many times do we come up for future agenda comments? Who keep, keeps track? And I've asked this question under future agenda yeah. comments. Who keeps track of what future agenda items have been brought up and puts them on the agenda? Do you know the, the, and no, no, I asked the question. And do you know what I got? I don't know. Now one thing, little old high school me was always taught working at McDonald's, working wherever I wanted to work. What do you never say? But I'll be glad to find that out for you. So if we're not doing our jobs and pushing for that, if our media is only asking the question, what's your platform? Not who, when, why, and how. We're not getting the answers we need and we're not asking the right questions. And we have to ask those questions of ourselves. You better find out because we are getting propaganda out there. I don't want to come to a meeting and hear about Americanism versus communism when every day my rights are being voided in my own county. Not one commissioner stood up and said, when Kevin Van Osnabridge decided to take away our ability to call in, not one commissioner stood up and defied him. Those are the people that you elected, and not one stood up to defy him. When we have candidates that say, I want to bring in call, call, bring back call and commenting, or, or booster our citizens' advisory committees and make them part of our policies, processes, and procedures, ask them how they're going to do that as the one and only person on the board. You have to have some teamwork involved. And you may have to have that teamwork with people whose views do not align with yours. But that is the art of the deal to learn to find solutions and compromise. And we don't give up things with compromising. We give things with compromising. And we've got to start doing our jobs because that's what I'm seeing our biggest problem is. As Pogo said, we have met the enemy and he is us. has passed down statutes that the school then has made procedures for removing the books out of the schools. Um, last meeting, we have Read On Manatee, who has now decided that they're going to put all the books back in the schools that we've had removed. These are all the books on both sides that we have um, contested and either got removed or they're under consideration right now. This is uh, Maria Massifer, Mark Massifer's wife, who writes the Bradenton Times. Okay. At our last meeting, we had some great entertainment. We finally had a transvestite show up. <laughs> 
everybody is free to live a life the way that they want. You can come into the school board and talk all about what you feel is passionate to you. They had a whole lineup of people this time to come in and talk about the books that were been removed. They read excerpts from two books that have been removed, and they were lovely passages. Flamer is one of the books that they chose to speak about. You can see all the awards and accolades that it's got all in 2020. Strange that it was all one year that it won all these awards. This is what is in this book. This is for 14 year olds and up. Part of a picture book. They want to say that this is about parental rights and First Amendment speech. We have to talk about getting morality back in our schools. This is another book that they talked about and read passages, lovely passages out of. This book contains sexual activities, bestiality, violence, racial commentary, derogatory terms. This is how they want to portray the book. Yes, it is about slavery and plantation owners. But this is really what's in the book. He held her breasts in the palm of his hands. 25 years from his recent memory, which means that this is an older man who's going back in time to try to act like he can have sexual relations with a child. It was over before they could even get her clothes off. One sucking on my breast at the other holding me down. While the, read, the reading teacher was watching and writing it up. Only when she was dead would they be safe. while he hoisted her skirt and turned her head over her shoulder. If the school teacher was right, it explained how he had come to be a rag doll, picked up back and down anywhere, anytime by a girl young enough to be his daughter. He was convinced that he didn't want to, wherever she turned her behind. Cracked in resolve, but it was more than appetite that humiliated him and made him the wonder if the school teacher was right. I mean, this goes on and on. Now he's asking um, for her to have a baby with him. These are the derogatory terms that were just in that book alone. This book has uh, been brought up for review, and you see where it says available with restrictions. It is still in our schools with parental consent. Only three schools decided to remove it completely. But now they have made new media um, procedures in the school that if one school removes it, they all remove it. So we just got another win on that. So they come, they've come in and they want to say that we're not the left, this this group, that we're not following the right procedures. We're following everything. The school's working well with us. Everything is moving forward, but because we're being effective, they're now coming in, finding other loopholes to try to stop this. But they forget that in HB 1069, parents have the right to read the passages from any material that is subject to an objection. If the school board denies a parent the right to read the passage, it will be removed immediately. So how far do they want to push us? These are all the books that we have um, been able to remove from the schools in the last two years. This is the objection forms that we filled out. It's very detailed. We explain exactly what the reason is. We uh, cite the statute. We cite summaries, book reviews. We do all of the work for them. This isn't something that we're just nearly really going through. But as you can see, there is an issue with all of that list of books we have a problem in the schools. This book we just submitted. Read, this is page eight. This is how the book starts out. I can't see it. Oh. <laughs> 
You don't even want me to read it in here. So this is one of the issues is we're doing our part and we're being affected. But this is harmful to children. And somehow they're not going to stop. And at some point, I think you're going to have to help us and step in. Because this is, if this isn't pornography, and this is worse. I don't know what is. You know, we're, we can't save the children if this is going on in our schools. And they say it's not. This is the new librarian at Lakewood Ranch Library, public library. Yes. Her, this is Tiffany. We are monitoring Tiffany also and the public libraries. This is on her Facebook page. Don't have to explain anything to anybody about anything. <laughs> this is why we need common sense for all and Mark Stanick on the board. Anybody heard of uh, Joe D. Bartolomeo? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, Joe's running as an NDA against Ray Turner, or Dr. Mary Race, and uh, of course, as I mentioned, Dr. Uh, also, just a bit of news: uh, James Satcher's coming out this year. Uh, SOE seat that uh, was just vacated by Mike Bennett. Uh, he'll be in a primary race uh, running against Scott Carrington. Uh, Mixon's food truck will be here tomorrow from 11 to 4. Right. Notice how I detoured right off politics. <laughs> <laughs> kind of brought you back because I could tell I was losing some of it. <laughs> okay. uh, one thing to talk about calling your um, your um, uh, senators and, and, and representatives. Uh, the Senate border deal right now is on life support. The House bill is much worse. Call your senators, Rubio, Scott, and uh, our rep is Vern right now. Um, the um, it's 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 something else. This House bill gives more to the Ukraine than the border and Israel combined. If passed, here's the, here's the real kicker, and this is we if 
if this happens, we are sunk. And here's the deal. Written into this bill, into the language of this bill, is that the only court that can review this, if it's brought to suit, will be the U.S. District Court of Appeals in Washington, D.C., which is the worst of the 16 courts of appeal, are the most left-leaning, left-longing, unbelievable. But uh, again, uh, you, you guys need to also be aware, I know that it seems like we don't have as much to do with the uh, on the national uh, arena, but we do have two senators and a, uh, a representative that we need to call and let them know that um, do not even think about it. Uh, I don't think it'll get through the Senate, but the House bill, uh, supposedly the Speaker said that uh, it wouldn't see the light of day, but he said that on, oh no! <laughs> Big money, table free. Uh, I'm sorry, I just always wanted to say that. Uh, but it's, um, it's, it's, it's indicative of us to let our uh, national officials know that we are here locally and uh, we do control some of their votes. Now, next up, the reason you're here, the reason you came tonight. Some people thought it was for the food, but that's not the case. Tonight, it is my pleasure to introduce to you Sheriff Rick Wells. He was sworn in as Sheriff of Manatee County on January 3rd, 2017. So he's getting to be an old hand at this. He's getting, he's getting to the point that he's getting really, really good and we don't want to lose him. Just saying. Thank you. Okay. Um, I, I, a lot of people don't realize that uh, uh, Rick was on the highway patrol for 21 years. My brother-in-law uh, just retired from the highway patrol, George Tawny. I don't know if you knew George Tawny. I worked with George for a long time. Yes. Oh. A long time. Y'all, that's all. Really? Yeah. yeah. It was something I liked about y'all. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. So don't mess with me. <laughs> I have friends in high places. <laughs> they carry guns. <laughs> and anyway, he was 21 years in Florida Highway Patrol, but he was also the police chief uh, of Palmetto from 2010 to 2015. A lot of people don't know that. So he's just got an absolute ton of background. Uh, he graduated from Manatee High in 1982, so he is a local fellow. And how many of you know his dad? How many of you bought a house from his mom? <laughs> we made all our signs. I love her. You know. um, this is some of the things he's, he's involved in. 1991, Sheriff Wells was named the Mantee County Law Enforcement Officer of the Year. He received the Mantee County Whitney Knutson Award in 1991. Uh, the Visionary Award in 2012, the NAACP Humanitarian Award in 2014, uh, the Edgar H. Price Jr. Humanitarian Award in 2016. Uh, he's serving as an instructor in his field. Sheriff Wells taught law enforcement to governmental, educational, and community organizations throughout Florida. Currently the Executive Director of Manatee County Police League, Chairperson of the Manatee County Law Enforcement Advisory Board, Council for the Manatee Technical College, and a board member of the North Manatee Kiwanis Replay Advisory Council and Strength in Action. Sheriff Wells also served with the Boy Scouts of America, Keep Manatee Beautiful, Manatee Substance Abuse Prevention Coalition, and the North Manatee Storm. Dang, what have you, the list would be shorter next time you just know what you haven't done. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, my good friend Rick Wells. Good evening, y'all. It's, uh, it's always a pleasure to to be in front of people that I actually like. Uh, <laughs> thanks for having me. I want to say hi to my good friend Glenn back there. Glenn, I want you to stick to the record in front of all these great Americans. I, did I return your emails? Yes. Sir. Okay. All right. All right. And for those of you that don't know what my platform is, it's Law and Order. That's what I stand for. I've been doing this job for almost 40 years now. I've been very blessed. Um, I, I come from a law enforcement family. My, my, my father was in law enforcement uh, as I was growing up. He was a state trooper for 16 years as well, so 
that's pretty much the, the family's heritage. That's, that's all I know. So, uh, I do want to say, uh, Colonel Tatum, that uh, if I was you, I would just tell people that uh, your hair is that way because you let your wife cut it. Right? Yeah, that's, that's a good story, right? You look good. So as we talk about growth, and I know that uh, that's, that's a big topic for all of us. I have been here for most of my life. So like many of you, I've seen a lot of changes. And a lot of those changes, you know, that I, I, I'm not a fan of. The growth comes great, a great responsibility for me, the Maine County Sheriff's Office. So we have to keep up with this growth and we have to try to keep all of you protected. So we continue to grow in size as is law enforcement officers at the Sheriff's Office, about 400 additional civilian employees. I cover 741 square miles of the unincorporated part of Manatee County. So if you want to look at it like this, I am the sheriff of Man Maria, all the way out to Duet. <laughs> that's that's all in my area. Um, and as you know, one day for service. I'm sorry, a year. <laughs> <laughs> that would be impressive. That would be impressive. 900 plus calls a day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A lot of deputies. Yeah. <laughs> so we, uh, we, we have a lot of work in front of us, right? So we are trying to do everything we can each and every day. I start my job every day about 5.30 in the morning. And that's if I didn't get calls in the middle of the night. My focus is one thing and one thing only. And that is preventing crime and solving crime. And that's all we talk about all day, each and every day. And it's, it's a huge task. And I'm very blessed to have, and I'm not biased, I have some of the best men and women in uniform in this state of Florida. I can guarantee you that. So our biggest... Uh, focus is, is crime and we have been very blessed to have a 38 percent reduction in crime since I was elected sheriff back in 2017 and once again I always tell people if, if something bad is going on it's my fault everything good is because those men and women are out there so when we're in bed and we're dreaming about candy canes and unicorns they're out there trying to protect our communities they're out there um, doing the job that many want it's become tougher and tougher for them every year. But I can tell you that this county respects law enforcement. Regardless of what you see throughout this country, in Manatee County, the city, the men and women of you, we're grateful for that. So thank you all for that. We have several issues that we deal with. Our focus is always violent crime, uh, reduction in violent crime since I've been sheriff. And that's really about getting bad guys off the street that are victimizing us most of the time with stolen firearms, right? So as you know, when we talk about firearms, and this is what this always irritates me when we start talking about gun laws and what and what the left believes. Uh, we need to do with our guns is that bad guys don't go to the gun show <laughs> or the gun shop and wait three days for a, a gun like we do. They they steal their guns or they buy their guns uh, off the street. If you don't remember anything that I say tonight, the biggest issue that we have in Manti County are vehicle burglaries from unlocked vehicles. Every single night, we are trying to stop, usually young males, some juveniles, mostly juveniles, from walking into our communities and, and just walking down the street, checking door handles, and that's what they do. And this is a, 
a crime of opportunity. And this is where I stress the most to all of the citizens that I'm talking to, is that we can't do much about a criminal's desire or their ability to commit a crime. We can damn sure do something about the opportunity. Yeah. And unfortunately, we give them enough opportunities to steal from us. And that's something that we have to do a better job at. And then we're leaving our guns inside of these unlocked vehicles. We had 83 guns stolen last year in Manatee County from vehicles. And those are the guns that are being used out here on these streets by criminals trying to victimize someone else. So I, I have preached and preached and preached, and, and, I, and I'll preach it again until someone listens, but we have to do a better job at securing our firearms. So I tell people, all I, all I need you to do is just take one extra minute every night when you are going into your home, take out your personal belongings, and please take your gun and secure it in your house. Because that would save us uh, a lot of hardship. Um, about four weeks ago, I got a call, middle of the night. A, uh, a young 17-year-old kid was breaking into cars in a mobile home community here off of uh, State Road 70 and 9th Street East. We got a call from a citizen that alerted us that he was walking around. I had a canine unit respond to the area. The deputy and the canine are tracking the suspect. We are coming around uh, the corner, uh, around the mobile home. We engaged the night before in that same community. This 17-year-old had stolen a gun. And when he saw my canine and my canine deputy, he started to fire at oh, the God. deputy. He fired three shots at my deputy and two shots at my canine. Now, I want you to picture this if you can. Our, our canines are like our kids, okay? They are that important to us. This deputy is taking fire. He has to return fire as his dog as in, is engaging on the suspect. What's his main concern? He'd rather take a bullet than shoot that dog. So he has to wait until the dog is clear before he fires back. So we, we strike the subject. Luckily, the deputy was not injured. The canine was not injured. Um, the suspect was apprehended. And uh, he now sits in the Manatee County Jail so we direct file on him. And he turned 18 years old in my jail. That's sad, y'all. That's very sad. If he would have just complied and, and stopped when the deputy told him to stop, he would have, maybe maybe at that time he spent 21 days in the juvenile detention, he would have been let, let go. Uh, maybe he learned, he would have learned his lesson, I don't know. Two days later, we have another juvenile who is breaking into a home that's still under construction, but is about to be released to the owner. The security guard is alerted the security guard goes into the house and approaches the suspect, who also has a stolen gun in his possession, tries to fire at the security guard. The only reason why no one was hurt during that case is because he did not know how to operate the firearm. He didn't have a round in the chamber, and he did not know how to get a round into the chamber. Thank God. <laughs> He ran from us, and we, we were able to locate him with the gun, and he now sits in the Manti County Jail. So people ask me, well, what's going on with all these juveniles? I don't know. I'm not their daddy. I'm not their mama. But we're, we're having an issue with, with parenting uh, in, in, in this nation. I mean, if that would have been my child, your child, he would have wanted to go to jail, yeah. right? <laughs> because we've been taking care of that. Yeah. And it's about accountability. And our juvenile justice system is, is broken. We arrest a lot of kids, unfortunately, for breaking into cars. They spend very little time uh, in juvenile detention. They are released immediately, and then they go right back out because there's no consequences. Right? They're not worried about 
a long-term jail sentence. They're not going to get that. They're juveniles. And I'm all for helping a juvenile who's made a mistake turn their life around. I really am. If you go into Walmart and still, you know, maybe you steal a pair of socks, we can help you. Don't do that again. But when you're out here committing violent crime, uh, there's, there's no more second chances. And so there, there's a bill right now that's uh, in the Senate and the House that would enhance um, the, the penalty for a juvenile that has a gun in their possession. And remember, they're not supposed to have a gun at all. They're not legally able to purchase a gun. Um, so it would, it would increase the penalty from a third degree misdemeanor to a first or a, a first degree misdemeanor to a third degree felony. Um, is that going to help? I don't know, but we need to do a better job of trying to educate our kids. I know that we in this room would love nothing better than to, to make sure that the children in our community were, were being educated on how to do the right thing. Um, but we can only do so much. And I tell people all the time that kids go to school. We, we have some great teachers in this county. I don't know how many of y'all have grandkids or kids in school. I have, I have one that's, that's at Brayden River High. Um, don't put that on, on film. <laughs> that's a security risk. Uh, so and I have one that's at University of Central Florida. So I know the teachers in this county and how much they have met to, to my boys. So they're around great teachers. And maybe some of these kids that don't have a lot of parental guidance, maybe they have coaches or a boys club or some type of mentors after school. But when they get home, there's no one there. There's no one helping them. There's no one paying attention. There's no one to guide them, and that is the problem that we're seeing out here. And law enforcement, unfortunately, um, are the ones that have to deal with it. So that is one of the biggest problems right now. When you hear about vehicle burglars in Manatee County, I can guarantee you 95, 96% of those burglaries are being committed by juveniles. And if you've ever seen videos of how they work, they just walk down the street, door handle, door handle, oh, it's unlocked, go in, 30 seconds, they're out, and moving on to the next vehicle. So, please tell your friends, your family, your neighbors, anybody, that that's important to us to try to get that message out there that we, we have to do a better job. We also are tasked with trying to do more with the homeless. Now, if you would have, <coughs> excuse me, if you would have talked to me 40 years ago when I started in this profession that we were going to be responsible for having to help the homeless. I would have told you that you're crazy. All right? That's not our job. There's, there are services out there to help the homeless. No, they're not. And what I have found, and I, I, no disrespect to any of these different organizations that are out there, I don't see them doing enough to help the homeless population. And definitely, they're not doing enough to help the, the homeless veterans. They, they are not. So I, I put a, a group of deputies together. There, it's a resource assistance program. So I've got two deputies and I've got caseworkers, civilian caseworkers. And, and all they do each and every day is reach out to the homeless population. We've got camps throughout this entire county. I'm sure you already know this. And we try to give them the resources they need to either come in and let us find housing or placement for them. And if they don't want to go, then make sure that the services are brought to them. And I want you all to know, and I know that uh, Colonel Tatum knows this, we have a lot of families out here that are homeless. A lot of families. We have a lot of kids that are homeless living in cars or living in hotels that are having to go to school each and every day. It's, it's a huge problem. And I'm, I'm willing to do as much as I possibly can um, to, to try to help, and, and we will continue to try to expand that unit and to reach out to the homeless population and, and do what we can but uh, you know it's it, there's, there's a fine line right so we get calls from people who are irritated because they're trespassing on their property and we're trying not to put them in jail jail is not the place that I want them to be so we've got to find the resources for them and hopefully uh, do a better job at, at doing just that so that that's going on as well um, traffic 
So, Mandy County Sheriff's Office. <laughs> do do y'all know much about traffic? <laughs> yeah. We're responsible for every crime that takes place in the unincorporated part of Mandy County. So it doesn't matter what the crime is, my deputies have to respond. Normally, when I was a trooper in Florida Highway Patrol, when George and I, we worked, FHP worked all the crashes. Mm -hmm. FHP worked all of the details to try to reduce speed in different parts of, of the county. But they've been so short, very short-handed, they don't have the resources that, we, we had more troopers on the road back in 1986 when I was there than they, than they do now in 2024. Mm -hmm. Okay, the population has doubled since then. So we're having to pick up a lot of those crashes. Um, and, and I don't mind doing that, and I'll be completely honest with you, but every time I have a deputy working a crash, that means that deputy is not in your neighborhood. They're not patrolling, right? So that that's something, you know, so I'm working with, you know, the, the, the county commissioners as well, trying to increase my traffic unit so we can do more on that side as well because i know it's frustrating y'all i know i get calls all the time people are not happy with me because <laughs> someone's speeding in their neighborhood right and I, and I get it um we can't be everywhere at once we, we try to move around as much as we can to to, to try to show presence in areas that we know that speeding is taking place I mean, we, you know, State Road 70, State Road 64 is a racetrack, and then everything in between is a racetrack. <laughs> so we're going to continue to try to do what we can on the traffic side. I just want you to know that if you're involved in a crash, hopefully you're not, and you're having to wait, uh, wait there for two hours, it's not my fault. It's FHP. Call them. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of times we'll respond. We'll, we'll go work that crash because somebody will call and say, hey, I'm, we've been waiting here for two hours. I don't care who's supposed to work it, but you know, we need some relief. So we'll send a deputy out there to, to handle that. So the growth is definitely you know, having an impact on us, but we're going to continue to, to do what's necessary to increase the staff. Understand that. I mean, I, I'm, I'm a conservative, but when I increase my staff, I'm going, I have to increase my budget. The budget is going up each and every year. Just to understand, when you see an increase in Sheriff Wells' budget, it's not because I'm trying to put new furniture in my office. All right? <laughs> so know that. I'm trying to put boots, boots on the ground. Okay, that's what we're doing. Yes, sir. Uh, I understand that there are some jurisdictions in Florida that send out civilian employees to handle non-injury related MBA taxes. Yeah, I don't, there's some special training that comes with that. Um, there has been, some, we've had some discussions about that, but I don't believe that's accurate. The, can you tell me where they're doing that? Uh, Fred and Wine lives in Boynton Beach. And that was a civilian that works at traffic crash? Exactly, yes. It was not injury, it was uh, just like a yes. Is it like a gated community or it's out there? It was on a public road. Okay. Well, that's definitely something that we can address. I'm telling you, it's, it's pretty dangerous. So civilians being, that means they don't have a weapon. Right? Yes, Andrew, how are you? So um, you, there's been some changes going on. I brought it up to the county commissioners. And I'm going to bring it up here to see what you think we should do. So I noticed that they took your uh, ability to investigate children for child crimes away from the sheriff's office and put it back to the Department of Children and Family Services, which is something that I'm completely opposed to, and I know there's many people here that are opposed to that. Is there anything that we can do, because I know it's a state thing that was done, is there anything that we can do as a collective body? And um, also, when you're um, increasing your budget, are we going to have any kind of programs to try to target maybe some uh, adolescents or younger kids to get them before they get to 17, 16, 15, you know, opening car doors and stealing. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's the first part of your question. So back in 1997, then Governor Jeb Bush came to seven sheriffs 
Manti being one of them, and ask them to basically take over the responsibilities of DCF at the time. Um, because it, it was really, it was um, not DCF back in those days, but H, uh, not HRS. Uh, HRS, it was HRS, because they were struggling and badly. Um, so we met, we had that responsibility uh, until just last year. And the reason why the state wanted that part of it back now, we do we still handle all the criminal uh, child neglect cases. We handle all of that. They wanted that back because of the programs that the, that the state has in place with the federal money. And they they thought they could do a better job on placement and and those kids that are being removed. And honestly. The state has never really liked the sheriffs having that responsibility because they believe that we removed too many kids from their home, which is a crock. Uh, because we remove kids that need to be removed because their parents could not take care of them. They were abusing them. It was, and, and most of the time that was drug related. So unfortunately, that's already been done. The state took that side back. They're still here. A lot of my people that were CPS investigators they did go to the DCF side, but we handle all the criminal with them. And a lot of those DCF uh, or the CPS personnel didn't want to go to DCF, so I, I kept them with me. A lot of them are either going on the road as deputies, and some of them are doing the homeless outreach with, uh, with my rap team. So that's where we're at on that. And um, Yeah, I, I, I agree. That was the hardest thing that I've ever been through because those, those women, mostly, they've been with me since I've been sheriff. They, some of them have been here 15, 20 years. And that's why a lot of them stayed with me with the sheriff's office. And uh, I have short-term memory loss. What was your second question? Uh, the second question is we're going to have any outreach for the younger youth. Yeah. We, we, yeah, I, I think there's always room to grow with that. We we do uh, we have a lot of programs with our SROs and, and some, some other units within the agency. But I think we, we have to work closely with the school district, and I think that we can. One of the programs that was taken away was there back in the day. So you know we, we, we do have some resources in there. But yes, we do need to expand, and we can really work with. I, I know that the, the district feels the same way. That I do. So whatever we can do to, to enhance program, we'll do that. Let's, if, if we could hold our questions until Rick is finished with his yeah. presentation, and then we'll, I know he'll want to answer everything you've got to ask okay. or close to. Uh, I wasn't done yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll just say this. I, I'll say. And we do a lot of work, and I, I, it's important for you to know, because I know a lot has been said about our federal agencies. And I don't, I don't want you to see what's going on in Washington, especially with the FBI, and think that that is what, it, it, that's the mentality or the philosophy of the agents that work here. It's not. All right, they, they work with us. Uh, we have a couple of task force. And, and they work very closely with us when it comes to removing fugitives out of our community. Um, so whatever's going on with their leaders, hey, I, I get it. I'm, we're not, we're not going to work with anyone that doesn't share our philosophy when it comes to law and order and the Constitution. So they, are, they have the same vision I have, is bad guys have to go to jail. And sometimes these fugitives and we couldn't do without their resources so that's important to me we uh, work with the atf and we work with the atf because of criminals that are stealing guns from law-abiding americans and they're using them out here so not these guys that are out here and the women too that are out here working the streets they're good people but i don't work with them. i don't work with anybody that's not good like me so, <laughs> so, 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 so. Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, well, right, yes, along yeah. those, right along those lines, um, I know there's a lot of us that are very concerned about the open southern border. 
for the United States. We all are, yes ma'am. Yes, and, and I think we all share that concern. In law enforcement here in Manatee County, what are you seeing here in our county in terms of, what's the say? Yeah, I would, I would, I would be naive to think that that some of them have not taken up, you know, roots here. But we're not seeing that from a law enforcement perspective yet. All right. So when I, when I first got elected, there were a lot of issues with ICE on, and also with with the uh, Florida Supreme Court on, because I run the jail on holding criminal illegals in my jail once they had the uh, means to bond out. So if they could bond out, we couldn't hold them. So I was one of the first sheriffs, me and eight others, to sign an agreement with ICE, and they're called warrant service officers. They're dedicated personnel that gives us the right to hold that criminal illegal uh, for 48 hours until ICE can come in and, and do their job before we couldn't do that so but i have not noticed an increase in because if they come to my jail i'm going to know right away so we're not seeing that yet but i'll, I'll keep you up to date because i know once again i'd be naive to think they're not here we're just not seeing it on the law enforcement side on the criminal side right we see them in hotels when we're traveling i mean it's very it's very obvious oh yeah there's, yes there's there. absolutely and listen, that's not gonna that's not gonna go away until the right person gets an office. Right. So let's be honest. Yes, sir. Yeah, I I, uh, I think just today there was a case that came down. I think it was the first precedent in the country that held a parent criminally responsible for their son getting a gun which he used to kill uh, some some other fellow students. Uh, and we had an incident even in my neighborhood where you know, a kid got access to a gun and was brought to school. And obviously the kid was, you know, uh, disciplined and I think he had thrown out of school and so forth. I mean, do you see that as an issue about kids getting uh, their parents' guns? Well, that's already a law in the state of Florida. Yeah. So if, if you as a parent, if they do not secure their weapon mm -hmm. and uh, a child gets that weapon, and use it, they're, they're going to be charged, yeah. right? They are, they are going to be charged. The parents are going to be charged as well, right? Um, we're not seeing, the most of the guns that we're seeing, the kids are stealing themselves out of vehicles, or they're buying them on the street because someone else stole the gun. That's what we see. Yes, sir. Uh, Manatee is kind of unusual, and not in the limelight, uh, as regards a lot of the uh, national and international crime. But as I talked to you before, I find the Muslim Brotherhood not care. I'm a bad guy. Now, I realize you're not impacted that much. I can give you a lot of examples, but I don't know how I care. But I believe that uh, CARE, the Muslim Brotherhood, is the largest criminal enterprise in the world. And uh, I would base that on uh, them declaring that it's a uh, it's an explanatory memorandum. Have you ever heard of that? Yes. Okay. Uh, and of course, in it, they're declaring to dominate and destroy America uh, from within and mandate the practice of their culture of law. And as a matter of being publicly aware, would you support the training? Of the Manatee County Sheriff's Department and the fundamentals of this criminal element. That's just a question. And uh, you want me to answer it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I would be more happy to sit down and talk to you and look at that training. If, if, if it's if the training is adequate, right? Then I would be you know, very interested. I wouldn't bring anything to your level. That wasn't adequate. Yes, sir. We, I think we have a proven record. We've got a lot of sheriffs. Uh, our, our group is trained. Uh, all of the Texas. Uh, uh, Rangers and that sort of thing. So we have credibility. And yes, I would like to talk to you about that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Glenn. Say your name for the record. Yeah, <laughs> the greatest sheriff ever. So I know you find this hard to believe, but I can't get a straight answer from the county. I thought maybe you would give me some clarity. I would do my best. On the, the Musgrove property. So it took a year Holy to Holy shit, are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> Utilities wanted. I thought you were going to go out there, and then the new board came in. It was the worst deal ever. 
My question is, was that a suitable site for you at the time? Yes. And two, did, did you choose the Buck, where you go, Buckeye now or somewhere, right? Yes. So I don't understand that process and your feedback because I thought it was a great a great piece of property. We we were always just, we were, I was elated when they first came to me and asked me if that would be a proper location for my, this is my fleet management, right? So we, right now, my, my my fleet building where we do all the work on all the thousand plus vehicles that we have is on Florida Boulevard. It used to be an old inspection station back in the day, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so we've been trying to get a new facility built for it's been ten years. And so we they came to me, that administration, and I said, Yeah, that would be perfect because it's it's centralized, right? So I looked at the fact that it's east, but really it's not that far east anymore, and we know that, you know, everything is growing and, and pushing out in that area. It'd be a nice central location for for my my deputies to get to the, the garage quickly, whatever they gotta do, and get back on the road, right? Or get a pull car and get back on the road. So really the, the Buckeye property was like the last option they gave me. Like I, like I had no more options. So I I, I needed to take it because it was kind of like that or they're going to keep looking and uh, I would have I would have you know like like to have been there and I, I don't know even now but uh, we're not going to be on it. <laughs> yes ma'am. First time I live out in East County and we can we really appreciate what our sheriff's department has done. Um, they're wonderful out there if it's anything from a cow in the road, capturing snakes, those kind of things that we have. But I am concerned about crime rising in other areas of District 1 and exactly what your topic was, that people leaving there, we don't, crime out of my ACA is like we know who it is. <laughs> <laughs> and, and nobody's going to come into a five-strand barbed wire place with the long dirt road and the pit bull barking at it. Because they're actually worried about being shot, <laughs> which is a good thing, right? Yeah. <laughs> let's, let's be honest, right? You yeah, pretty much live past 675 and there's no yeah. fear. Um, <laughs> but I am concerned about what's happening in other parts of our new District 1 um, because I, it still seems that the crime is in correlation with the, the density. Um, I think you've done a great job of trying to tell people not to leave their valuables in their car and to lock their cars, but we have people that uh, um, they have ring cameras. Um, what I'm sure you're aware of is uh, that they hop on 301 and head to Hillsborough County, head back and forth. Um, I know we have different ways of reciprocity between the different areas, but these are um, well-coordinated vet rings that are going on. And even though you've done a great job of telling people don't do that, um, a lot of the times the reason for the you don't have room to park a car on the street, you can only There's a lot of opportunity created. With all due respect for, I come from a law enforcement generation, I actually did not know because I thought that's what <laughs> people did on their days off, <laughs> being a, a fireman or a policeman. Um, but can we, is the, is the reasoning of asking for more uh, money in a budget, one thing Nobody has ever said no, right? Right. Nobody ever says no to law enforcement. If you say no to law enforcement, then you're seen as anti-cop. And that's not what we want. But would you be able to measure um, What's some of that performance, that on a more performance-based budget, if we're putting a lot of money into people, into advertising, to lock up your cars, to take your valuables out, and it's not working? then do we have other avenues if you haven't taken the personal responsibility to 
removed your firearm from your car and locked it, are there any consequences? Or does it just become a burden to your budget? Yeah, no. So that's like a 14 part question. So I'm going yeah, to get each one of them, right? So, so yeah, so I, we look, I, I look at the the, the density, I look at the, the numbers, I look at the population every every week. When I'm, I'm building the budget right now, so obviously you need to know that all my focus is out east because that's just common sense. We, that's where the growth is coming. We have, I have had discussions um, with legislators about holding those people accountable when you do leave a, a gun unsecured and easy prey, right, for someone to steal. Now, is that going to fly? I, I don't know. I don't know. But uh, if it's used in a crime, so I don't want to be the guy that has law enforcement knocking on their door, letting them know, hey, is this your stolen gun? It was just used in a homicide tonight. So I don't want to be that person. So we always, we always do the right thing. But we... Is that the right approach? I don't know. I don't know yet. I don't know if I want to penalize someone for being stupid yet. But uh, <laughs> right? But I mean, it is something we have to. I don't know if I want to penalize somebody because they just forgot to take their gun out. Right? I just, I just want to, I just want them to understand the importance of not doing that. And uh, so, because it's, we, we have people that leave their keys in their car still too. We have stolen vehicles. This is not, you know, what you see on TV, hot wire and all that. No, we we make it way too easy for them. We just leave the keys in there. You don't have to hot wire anything. Just leave the keys in there. Now, I try to tell people this is not this is not Mayberry. Right? So you can't you can't do that. And I don't even understand that mentality. I, I, I don't understand how you can leave your car with your keys in there and everything else that you own. You're just begging. I mean, that's like that's like a false insurance claim to me. Oh, you're just trying to get that heap of junk out of your driveway so you can get an insurance claim and get a new car. Yes, sir. Uh, Jeff, I think I can comfortably speak for the entire group here of this. Your department does a wonderful job in keeping crime down, and you have a well, thank you. My comment is on a scale of 1 to 10, what I'm about to probably ask you is I'm out to about a number 2, and that is traffic enforcement, traffic violation enforcement. Now, as a casual observer for the past year and a half or so, maybe more so than casual, it seems to me that the entire community, all of us, people are driving faster and faster, and they're, they're very impatient and more horn honking. So my, my concern is that these statements of 30, 35, 45 are practically non-existent. People are just, that they pass me all the time on 44th Avenue at 60, I think it's close to 45. My question is this, is there any empirical, statistical evidence that speeding above those ranges you know, causes a higher accident, accident rate? Who keeps track of, of what causes an accident and where does it fall on the scale? So yeah, FCOT keeps all that, all that data. And they base speed limits. Most, most of the speed limits outside of the residential area is based on population in that, in that area. Right? So a lot of times they're using population um, on how they set. That's why you'll see maybe on State Road 7, State Road 70, 45, and then when you get past, like out to the rain, then it goes up to you know, 55. It's, everything's based on population. But they, they hold all all the stats. You don't need the stats. I don't need the stats. We already know what see we know what's going on out there. So it's not so much the speed that people are traveling and causing this crisis. It's this absolute disregard for paying attention to anything. It's the phones. They're still on these dang phones. Right? The law is not working when it comes to driving and texting and all that, people are still doing it. They're not paying attention. That's why you're having, because it doesn't really matter if you're doing 35 or 55. If you're not paying attention and a car stops in front of you, you know, it, it's going to be a rear end collision. So it's just pure carelessness. And I don't know how else to explain just to, there's, there's no regard to, to traffic statutes at all. 
They just don't care. But we see a lot more because we have so many more vehicles on the road. Yes, ma'am. Well, I realize that there's no law against stupidity. <laughs> if there was, I'd have to build a bigger jail. <laughs> no law against laziness. But I think there should be a law against leaving your gun in your car because it's dangerous everyone. Yeah, we, we're definitely, I, I, in fact, I just had a conversation about that with uh, Senator Boyd for the next session. We're going to take a look at it uh, because if it's used in a crime, and I think, you know, we're, we're, we're going to have to, we're going to have to see. But, so I'm telling you, my deputy was almost killed just by the grace of God. Right. And that's from a stolen gun. That he got, like I said, from from a, a vehicle and that before. Careless, so, yes, ma'am. Yeah. But the but the man, it, it just it was a mistake on his part. He didn't know that he had left the door unlocked. I mean, there's a lot that goes into writing a bill, and that's going to affect someone. So, you know, I I I can't disagree with you. Oh, I'm sorry. Hey, man. Hi. Um, are you going to be endorsing people from us? And I don't I don't endorse county commissioners at all. I don't endorse county commissioners. Okay. So as far as being her ex employer, I'm just wondering what qualifications that you think she has for becoming commissioner. I think she's got as much qualification as anybody else on that board. Um, <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, going back to the uh, border crisis, uh, I would be interested to know your view on this, if it would be something that would be helpful or not. Uh, I was just kind of winging it when I was public comment uh, before the commission one meeting. When they first started talking about the fact that the Department of Homeland Security was importing and spreading illegal aliens all over the country. So we're going back you know, a number of years right now. But I went in and I asked if they would just hold a public meeting where all the law enforcement branches within the county, the county commissioner, um, the public, we could all come like we did back when there was a crisis over the funding for the indigent health care. Um, I said, I don't have a solution today, but I think we need to get together now and address it before that first Homeland Security bus crosses the you know, northern boundary or southern boundary. Well, how are they going to get into Mandy County? And the county commissioner, uh, commission chairman at the time said, Mr. Whitaker, there's nothing we can do about that. And I said, well, ma'am, you're the only people that can. You're the legislature for this county. And I said, you know, just off the top of my head, didn't think this through, but it seems to me that today before you adjourn, you could pass an ordinance making it a felony to illegally import illegal aliens into Mandy County, which would then give the deputy the power to stop them at the county line, impound the vehicle that's being used in the commission of a felony, uh, take all the occupants and hand them over to ICE and put the driver in jail. If ICE would take them. You're, 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 I you're understand. Assuming. I'm just throwing yeah. this out there. Yeah. Okay. But the driver would be convicted of a felony and you'd have a free bus. So, I mean, it, it would, I think it would discourage. They would go to somewhere else. But I just wanted to I mean that, you know, I just was off the top of my head. I think we'd come up with something better, but I just thought I'd throw that out to you. Okay. Drive them yeah. up to Marshall. Reaction. Yeah. On that, I don't know. Stop someone, and you can't come into Mansion. Well, no, let's say you're you, through your cooperation. You know, they so why is that not being done now in any other state? Well, what, what do you think is the reason? Do you have any thoughts oh, on oh, that? I have, I have, I have a, a definitive answer to that question. What is that? It's okay. But and my question to you is, let's say, for example, you know, they stopped at the rest stop north of here. They all unloaded. You know, every, people notice, hey, nobody speaks English. And they all pile back on. And somebody picks up the phone and says, I know down in Mankey County, they don't let them come in to the county. So calls your office and says, hey, Sheriff, I think you got a busload of illegal aliens hidden your way. 
So you, you have probable cause. You see him come in. How, okay, I, I know where you're going. How is that probable cause when you when you don't know, right, 100% that they are, maybe they're not illegal? How do we know? So really? if we stop them, they? if we stop them, and they, yeah. what if I stop them and, and, and half the buses are legal citizens? How about reasonable suspicion? That doesn't play. That doesn't play up there. I can't stop a vehicle for reasonable, reasonable okay. suspicion. Well, I had to have probable cause, and you know this. Well, stopping the vehicle is one thing. Yes, sir. You could have the driver come out, and you could ask him appropriate questions. We, we, could, we could do that. Yeah. yeah. And then if he satisfies, dispels the concern, fine. By your con Dios. But if, but if not, then you could ask, you know, to have everybody just produce identification because it's a clear and present danger in Manti County that if the federal government's not going to secure a border, then it's incumbent upon the state level, and if they won't do it, then it's incumbent upon the county level. I mean, I just thought I'd throw it out there for Texas your reaction. Okay. Excuse me? You have what Texas is going through right yeah. now. I, I know that. It, it's like a... I'm not saying I had the gift of prophecy, but it doesn't take a, a ta you know really a legal scholar to see the arc of where we're going. Yeah. Oh, I agree with that. But but we also would you would you would you agree that we've had illegal immigrants in this county for as long as you and I have been here? Right, but it's like yeah. lightning and lightning bug. Yeah. Okay. But I'm, but I'm saying, but but right. every, every day. You don't know who they are. They go to work. Right. You you've gone past the fields, right? Sure. Have you ever gone in there to try to get them off the fields or call it ice? I, we don't I, know. I, I mean, I, I went over to Parkland uh, in uh, Plant City uh, and got a strawberry milkshake on the way back from Fred's the other day. And I'm driving by all the strawberry fields. So yeah, I know that. But it's, that's a big difference than when you've got military age guys pouring in, and we know there's a clear and present danger. That well, elevates things. If, if I know then we will definitely have a discussion with them. But have you known that to happen? Has someone, did someone call you and let you know this already? That we had a bus of well, illegal I, immigrants? Because I, I haven't yeah. had that call yet. Well, I was asking you that. No, yeah. I had somebody tell me they wanted a particular restaurant that's not in business. They were concerned that perhaps they were bunking in there. But Who are they? I'm not law enforcement. Well, they didn't call me. Why they call you? Why they call me? So we go look at it. Okay. All Good right. Question. I mean, you can let me know. But I'm staying with my one question about the border. If we can protect it, if that's an idea. We, we we can have we can, I can have a discussion with the people that that uh, I would need to bring into the room. Yeah. If that. If we do see something, who do we say it? Who do we call? You call me. You call Sheriff's office. Well, knowing who at your office would you call? What number would you call? Well, if it's something active, 911? No, I'm talking about, you see a bus like that, you know what we're looking at. <coughs> who we call? See, okay, you, you would call the Sheriff's office and say you have a suspicious vehicle. Okay. And then we would have to so check out that. Yeah, non emergency. 747 okay. 3011. Okay, good. Probable cause. Probable cause doesn't matter right now. We'll work on that. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, do, you, do you have a staff shortage problem at this moment? I wouldn't say we have a staff shortage problem. We, we're always having to staff every year to keep up with the population. Maintaining now. That's becoming so prevalent. I know. Strong standard against people using drugs, and now that many say something else, how has that affected your human? You do drugs, you don't get high. <laughs> it hasn't, hasn't changed at all, and, I, and that's it's, it's the same with medical marijuana. If you have medical marijuana, you're not going to be higher. That's that standard will not change. Yes, sir. Uh, sort of following up on that uh, question about staffing, the last couple of years, uh, just watching the news, I've seen where police in other places were really not treated very well. Departments were defunded. I mean, we've all seen this in the news for a while. And I found myself thinking when I saw that, I bet places like Manatee County get their pick of people who want to get out of those other places and maybe come someplace where the police are respected. 
So do you, do you see a lot of applications from out of state? We do, um, but we always have because a lot of times it's, it's, it's law enforcement officers who are getting close to retirement. They want to come to a retirement community. So they want to keep working. And so a lot of, but this, this is what you have to, we are always accepting out-of-state law enforcement officers who want to get away from that minutia that they're in now. But we do have some strict competition. Go to Texas, right? They'll go to several of the sheriff's offices here in the state of Florida because we all have the same philosophy, right? But um, for the most part, yeah. the, the red counties. Um, <clears throat> but we, we get, we, we have a lot of New Yorkers. If you go to the courthouse, they, you'll know they're not from Alabama when they talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> we get them. Thank you, Sheriff. Is it? Yeah, okay. All right, you're going to keep it. Hey. One more. So, um, we're not going to be boss. We've talked before about all of us and we're the books. Um, what, what is considered pornography? Where is the line when we have documents that are in the schools that are pornographic? Um, we are having them removed, but we have the issue with the families outside, with not you know, that disconnect. So, and well, the disconnect, we should have a well connected board right now would, would you say that i'm talking about the family unit well, but, okay the, um, I'm, i don't understand the question the family unit outside that are reading these books to their kids that are not participating in in helping the community or helping their kids you know they're not at home so they kids are just rampant these days right and then the sex trafficking and all of that these kids kind of just gravitate to that because they're not at home getting good guidance. And but again, we are still facilitating this kind of thing in the schools. How can we stop all of this? How can we... In the school? Are we not doing that now? Are we not looking and reviewing books now? Yeah, we, we are we are. not getting those books out of the library so, now? Yes. Okay. So... Because so I've heard nothing but good things about what's been transpiring since we last talked right. with the new board. Right. Okay. So the people pushing up against it, they're not going to find a loophole or try to... We, we have a statute now. When, we, when you and I talked a couple years ago, there wasn't a statute. Right. We had an executive order, and then we had the bill. So we have teeth now. We didn't have teeth two okay. years ago, right? And I'm very confident in the board that we have in place that they have the same beliefs that I have and that you have. Okay. And they're not going to want, I know Cindy Spray, and I know the current one, they're not going to have those books right. in there and unless they don't know it and they have to go back yeah. and remove them. Mm -hmm. You yes. feel the same way? Yes. Okay. And you're, you're backing that too. Uh, yes. Okay. Yes. Right. Okay. Is there anybody has an easy question? <laughs> 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 yeah. Huh? Who's going to win the Super Bowl? <laughs> <laughs> Well, if there's nothing else, I want to say thank you personally for well, thank you. Out yeah, I appreciate it. With us. We, we love it when you come out and, and get us all informed and uh, up stuff. And y'all quit leaving your guns in the car. <laughs> I know y'all don't do that. <laughs> Thanks for watching Manatee Local. Here's a schedule of future events that I'm going to be taping. Dr. Robert McCann at Manatee Patriots next Tuesday, the 13th, 22nd, Tal Sadiq in Teresia, and 24th, Saturday morning, Diana Shoemaker at the Central Library with Take Action in West Manatee and the Islands. Hope to see you then.